Stay hungry, stay foolish. Do you have an idea for a business but don't know where to start? Thanks to high-speed internet, game-changing technology and innovative new platforms, you can go from idea to marketplace on a shoestring budget and join the growing movement of successful makers who've built their business from the ground up. In How We Make Stuff Now, our guest, co-founder and CEO of The Gromit, a product launch platform that helps innovative products reach a community of millions, guides us through every step of the consumer product creation process. The book is packed with fascinating case studies of successful startups and tells us how the smartest entrepreneurs overcome obstacles, solve challenges, and rise above the competition to deliver innovative products that consumers can't resist. Whether you're a self-starting newcomer to the world of e-commerce, a member of the maker movement, or an experienced entrepreneur, the first and crucial step in your journey to turning little ideas into big businesses is learning how we make stuff now. We welcome author of How We Make Stuff Now, Turn Ideas into Products That Build Successful Businesses, Jules Pieri. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Aidan. Glad to be here. Great to have you on the show, Jules. I have to say, I really felt that this book is written in miles of scar tissue. It's not just theory alone. (laughs) And that's what makes it a must read for makers and entrepreneurs of any kind. The book's packed with not only your personal experiences, but the many case studies on makers, are seriously comprehensive. I also really admired your humility to say that there's no universal formula, but the book is a really productive way to start. Oh, thanks so much. I have to say, when I finished the book and somebody asked me, like, was it hard? At first I said something like, well, honestly, the writing was easier than I thought. It went faster, better than I thought. And then I stopped myself and said, Heck no, because it took me 10 years to know all the stuff that was in there so that I could write it efficiently, right? It was a 10-year project. (laughs) And probably more, all this knowledge you'd accumulated, and it really comes across in the book, Jules. I thought we'd start with why you wrote this book in the first place and why you started the grommet. For me, it looked like it was to fight for the little guy, but also what you're doing maybe announced to yourself or maybe unbeknownst is enabling and facilitating innovation in the retail space. Yeah, you pretty much nailed it. I was watching this phenomenon happen. Now, this is back in the 90s, and I didn't start the grommet until 2008, but I started to see the need when I was at a big company. I was at Play School, and that's a big toy company. And I noticed that our best products, new ones, were not making it to market. And that didn't make sense to me. We had great R&D capability. Went to my boss, and she's famous now, Meg Whitman, but she was president of Play School back then, well before eBay and Hewlett Packard. And Meg said, Jules, here's the deal. We're losing all our independent distribution, the small guys who take chances on new products. So today, if Kmart, Target, Toys R Us, or Walmart don't want it, we can't make that toy. And that really pissed me off because... You know, we were depriving children and families of some great insights and developmental aids. And it was a waste of resources in our company. And I also knew that other than Toys R Us, toys weren't all that important to those those big retailers. That kind of just sat in the back of my brain, frankly. I thought it was inevitable. I thought, you know, this consolidation of retail was a train that would never stop. But here's what happened. One thing happened to me and one thing happened in the world. The thing that happened to me is I ran a social network and I became a pioneer in that industry. And I had early access to understanding how to create a community. And that was where I sort of put one plus one together where, wait a minute, I know there's this great explosion of innovative products. And that was the thing that also happened bigger than me. And they're going to be all dressed up with no place to go because retail cannot take risks on new products. It's, it's not part of their model anymore. So all these products, which are largely a product of technology shifts, all these companies and this energy around entrepreneurship is going to collide into this brick wall at retail. And I thought, I can fix that. I can do something about that by starting the grommet. And as you say, retailers still want innovative products. They just can't take 
that risk of dealing with potentially undercapitalized and unreliable companies. And you do a great job of giving us empathy towards the retailer as well and seeing why they take such large margins and also make the call that if it's worth it or not. And we'll get into that in a little while. But jumping into the book, you say making the product is just a start. It reminded me of somebody writing a book that you write the book and then, as you know, you then have to get a published, find an agent and all that. And then you're in the real game. And you mentioned 16 required competencies. Here's the reality. I'm going to make a bold claim that these companies definitively innovate faster and make better products than big companies. So they have a massive edge and starting to to show up statistically that that's true. But the minute they're out in the market, then it's the big leagues. And then those other competencies like protecting your intellectual property or having good packaging or being able to ship efficiently or being able to acquire customers and market well, those things are where a big company often has all the advantages because they've had years to build either retail distribution or they have an army of lawyers to set up patents and protect those patents. So, then the little guy is really scrambling because the product won't be quite enough. I've never seen a world where if you build it, they will come. That just doesn't happen. You call out the huge opportunity that's here. You give the figures behind the maker movement, etc. And we won't go into that because I think the real value in what you did is you use that as a foundation for the book. And then you go into the actual rawness of how it is to be a maker. But you call out the opportunity that there's many stale incumbents, many of these companies that don't have an R&D function at all and they're losing market share, yet there's no investment in the little guy. Yeah. So um, grocery is in all developed countries is one of the more um, measured industries. So CPG, consumer packaged goods and food is having this dramatic shift. And this is the U.S. Little brands, upstart brands have taken 19% share from big brands in grocery in the last six years. I learned that after I wrote the book. That's dramatic because you're putting this product in your mouth, in your body, and you're choosing, going out of your way to pick a company you probably never heard of, certainly a smaller one. And you're doing it probably, or US consumers are, because of what you just said, that the big guys have a little, they've had two problems. They've overinvested in marketing to prop up tired brands. And they've been under siege with the general discounting happening at retail. So their margins have been squeezed. So the first thing that goes is R&D. And they've lost sight of consumer preferences and foods, you know, pretty obvious, whether it's the variety of um, various diets that people follow or, or just a concern for natural or lifestyle around food. They've been fighting a battle on a few fronts, these big companies. But not the battle that probably is most important, which is to have brilliant products. And the opportunity is clear. You do a great job of kind of building that up and presenting that. But then you're also, as I mentioned, humble enough to say to the reader and to the maker, perhaps, or the potential entrepreneur, that you really need to be sure that you want to embark on this journey. And it'd be great to touch on that because we're really betting on our family security and your own sanity that the maker movement will be the right thing for you or the entrepreneurial shift will be right for you. And you call out lots of things you need to consider before quitting the day job. Yeah. So the the biggest first one is, is there a real business opportunity here? And I would do anything you possibly can, can to quantify that in that you want to be sure you're not solving a small problem with a small number of people who care about it. You'd like to be solving a larger problem and one that people might even have persistently, not like the, the extreme of that would be um, quite often parents solve a real problem with a product. They are dealing with some developmental issue with their child, but that issue is very, very um, fleeting. And so by the time the parent starts looking for a solution, the problem's almost gone away. So even though the problem's real, the market opportunity isn't very good because people aren't in that problem for very long in the lifetime of raising their children. So that's an example of Eh, I probably wouldn't throw over my life to solve this problem that a child's going to present for a month of their life. Similarly, though, you can look at any 
area, whether it's through researching. In the U.S., we have small business administration offices, and they get you access to government data, which is our tax dollars at work, that are like gold to, to prove how many people are operating in any particular hobby or area of business. You can look at Amazon and see um, what's out there. So that's both market research as well as getting a sense of the, the volume um, of the products there. You can find flaws in the products. Um, Google Trends, are people searching for the problem you're looking to solve? So lots of ways to quantify this. You totally owe it to yourself because believe me, quantification is going to become a really important part of everything you do, whether it's efficiently acquire customers, producing the product with appropriate margins. Like you can't be afraid of the numbers right up front. Don't just look in the mirror, talk to your mother and brother and think you're onto something. And similarly, I would say that another chance, so that that's a little bit academic. That's a little bit like desk research right there, what I described to quantify that. But let's say you're pretty encouraged by what you see in terms of the potential market. Then another couple of things need to happen. This is emotional, but I would make sure that you really actually enjoy the work it takes to solve this problem. Like be honest with yourself. If you get sort of bored with it partway through and you're not even in the market yet, Take that seriously because you got to really love this product. You've got to be the type of person who will be um, almost socially ignorant in um, in that you want to talk about it all the time. Like you've got to love it that much. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. Like great entrepreneurs. I'm thinking of a man, Russ Wilcox. He invented the technology e-ink, started the company called e-ink. It's what powers Kindles and e-readers. He was on to a new venture. We were on a panel together speaking at Harvard Business School. And like this venture is brand new. He wanted to get into some kind of accelerator or contest. And we're in the middle of speaking. And he basically jumps up, writes a number on the whiteboard and tells everybody in the room, I need you to text blah, blah, blah to this number because that'll help me get votes for my new company into this contest. <laughs> Brilliant. Like, Guy's a you know millionaire, billionaire. I don't know, but that's not the point. The point is he's back at it, like you know, not shy to ask for help. So you got to have that kind of passion uh, and keep keep judging your own gut there about the product in the area and the people you need to talk to. And then I would say a third thing you can do, and this is a little further down the road, but prototyping is another pause point basically. So prototyping for me means getting the most low fidelity, roughest version of your product in front of strangers. That could be a sketch. That could be made out of paper, cardboard, clay. I, I'm not talking about uh, fancy CAD drawings or fancy 3D models. I'm talking about the most basic thing that helps people understand your idea. Not and and then getting it in front of those people who aren't who don't love you, who will tell you the truth, who aren't um, invested in your emotional security, and just will give you feedback because the minute you cross from sort of prototyping and really refining your idea into something that's going to be manufactured, you're committing to a much bigger uh, level of endeavor generally because you might be ordering tooling. You're definitely negotiating with a factory. You're unlikely to create your own factory. So you're, you're finding resources that are going to cost you money. So prototype is another good pause point. I love when you talk about prototyping and you mentioned the word there, commitment, and you say to consider the tail of the chicken and the pig. Yeah. So <laughs> um, essentially, you know, we'll think about a typical breakfast. The chicken is involved, right, with the eggs, but the pig, the pig is committed. Coming back to something you said here, you mentioned earlier on about tests in the marketplace and you do a brilliant thing with your module that you run in Harvard Business School where you get the students to test the marketplace with Facebook ads. This one is really low hanging fruit for people. Yeah. So quite often there are a lot of sort of starter programs for entrepreneurship for the students at Harvard Business School. And quite often they don't do a whole lot of guesswork about whether there's demand for the product. They will take a very small budget. We're talking about hundreds of dollars, not thousands. And put up some ads on Facebook that only lead to a, a web page that, you know, there is no product yet. There is no service yet. They're only describing what they might do in the future. And they want to see if people engage, click through. 
In some cases, they'll collect email addresses. Hey, when we do this later, can we reach out back out to you? But it's a measure of demand, a very, very um, easy way to measure demand. And if nobody's clicking on your ad, no matter what you do to it, that should tell you something. Again, I mentioned at the start that this book was written in scar tissue and that you include warts and all your experience, which is real wisdom. And you share your experience here with the grommet because you said that it was one of the things you would have done with the grommet was prototype early. Yeah, I didn't take my own advice. It's a shame on me because I'm an industrial designer. I value prototypes. So what I did was I was raising capital to start the business and, and the early capital came basically from friends. And I had this thing nobody asked for from me. It was like all in my own head. I'm not going to spend a dime until I've raised the round I want to raise so that I can be sure that I can execute on the the initial plans of this business. If I don't have all the capital, that would be hard to do. Big mistake. Here's why. If I had just taken five or $10,000 and worked with a software developer to develop a clickable prototype of what I expected our experience to be like, launching one product a day, a video, having a live conversation. I would have probably, I'm quite sure, raised money faster and been on my way in a, a more effective way with better investors because I was kind of waving my arms and using a PowerPoint, but a cl- there's there's no substitute for a prototype and a clickable website um, prototype would have been that for our business. What's, what held me back was a, that idea of like, it's a little bit of a rookie error, I suppose, like thinking I need all the money before I spend any of the money. But the other thing that held me back, which is a worse reason, the first reason I gave you is kind of human. The, the second reason is a really bad reason. I knew this business had to be executed well to inspire trust and to get high quality products onto the platform. And execute well meant to me not a clickable product type, but something that was fairly well refined. And you can't do that for just a couple thousand dollars. And so I was worried about putting something rough and ready out there in that it would make investors think I didn't know the difference or that this was what I thought was, you know, the final product. And, you know, looking back, that was a rookie era. I could have easily explained that. Could have easily shown uh, experiences, maybe not the grommet, but experiences that I thought were representative of what I was going for. I could have done, you know, some just some simple design mock ups of what that would look like so that they knew I had a clue about building a brand and a customer experience. But the prototype could have been pretty, pretty down and dirty and done a better job than my PowerPoint. Funding, as you say in the book, is close to your own heart and very deep in your experience, particularly because you launched the Gromit in 2008, right in the financial downturn. It'd be great to get an understanding of how a maker or an entrepreneur can approach funding. I think the thing that's interesting about funding a maker business is it's um, it's a lot different than, say, a software business. Our business, while it has an e-commerce component of it, effectively, you know, is funding a digital business, whereas makers have a whole different set of needs. They're looking to fund their early production. Uh, They're looking to fund usually a pretty skeletal team. They don't usually need a ton of people right up front. And quite often it's around marketing and sales. And they're looking to fund inventory. On the first one, sort of like, let's get going. Most of the work will be sweat equity at first, like whether it's big borrowing, stealing design or engineering resources, using your own capital you're unlikely to be able to fund some of the very earliest steps with outside investors unless you have access to you know, private capital and angel investors in your own network. But the big advantage in, in these products is that once you get to the point where you have a credible idea that's you know, developed and in, at least in a functional prototype, i.e. something that looks like the real product, you can go out to the crowdfunding platforms, which wouldn't have been available to us, but are God's gift to to these businesses. And the reason I like the crowdfunding platforms, and I particularly like Indiegogo for this purpose, is because they're almost like running a mini business right up front. So you get a taste of what your life could be like without quite having taken on the entire business necessarily. You're really usually trying to just get a little bit of market feedback, but mostly fund your early production run because that's what you've promised your backers. You'll send them a product. And uh, you have to run a pretty sophisticated marketing campaign to do that. Indiegogo gives you a ton of help, 
but you've got to stay on it. It's, it's something that, again, there's a lot of infrastructure around it and a lot of consultants who can help you to get a great video together and understand how to succeed, but you have to do the work. Like you learn back to that. If you build it, they will not come. You have to do the work. You have to get the word out there about your campaign. And of course the platforms will help, but I love that. And then I mentioned earlier that they might, uh, makers might be looking to fund either um, tooling or uh, an early sales team or marketing efforts or inventory. And I would say the other opportunities makers have that say software businesses don't have is funding inventory is not something you should do through giving away part of your company, i.e. raising you know equity funding. That's something where you can either get your retailers to prepay, which is not easy, but sometimes some of them will, or a partner who's interested, uh, like a larger company who's interested in seeing you succeed because they probably want to consider buying you someday, or more straightforward sort of bank loans and kind of more debt financing for inventory. You don't necessarily want to be giving away your company just to be buying inventory. So it's a, financing's a little more nuanced, I would say, in these companies than in the typical, you know, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg type vein, where you're pretty much going to a known set of angel investors, investor capital investors. The world here is more layered. Another word of caution you say here is that many times, if you take on VC money or angel money, you can be under undue or premature pressure for growth. And that premature growth can be almost fake growth or, or artificial growth where you're acquiring users or clients or customers prematurely with a new favor. And as do I have to say, a slower growth, a brand growth rather than sales on the back of kind of intermittent marketing campaigns. Yeah. I, and no, I would say we, that's more or less how the grommet grew. Um, it wasn't entirely my choice, frankly, as you mentioned the, the, um, I'd like to take credit for it. Oh yeah, we did it the right way. We went really slow for four years, but frankly, um, <laughs> there was no capital. <laughs> History is written by the victors, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. I guess I, I guess I haven't quite self-identified with victory yet. I'm I'm uh, I'm very aware of what the true story is, and the true story is there wasn't a lot of capital, so we did it the old-fashioned way, brick by brick, like every day, launching a a kick-ass great product that really had great quality. To this day, our return rates are under 3%. You know, we sell the product. When I modeled the business, I thought we'd be in the teens at least because these are unknown products. Like why would our e-commerce return rates be less than the the industry averages, which are double digit? Mm -hmm. Teen, nowhere near that, always been 3% because we actually were doing it the old fashioned way. These were products that were in our still worth your money and your time. But we were essentially building a big, uh, distinctive, competitive position, like something that's incredibly valuable because it's a very crowded world. So to be distinctive, to know who you are, to deliver consistently um, is, is very valuable. But the business was minuscule. We had zero capital to really scale in any way. So yeah, we did it the old fashioned way. And it you know, if you can survive as long as we did four years in that really, really kind of starvation state, then you have something to work with. Most companies and individuals just can't survive that long. It's pretty painful to live. I think a year or two in that state, you should expect that. And in fact, I wouldn't invest in somebody who wasn't willing to go through and show me that commitment through a year or two. Four is just probably twice as long as is humanely sane. Talking about funding, you call out that it's we need to really approach friends and family members with caution because we need to be sure that that relationship will last even if the business does not. With an angel investor, which in my early days were all friends, mostly people I'd been to school with, I would look them in the eye and say, look, Mark, I'm thinking of Mark Bono right now, a real person. Look, Mark, our friendship's really valuable to me and I am going to work. The, as hard as a human possibly can to give you the best return on this investment that you've ever seen. That is my goal and my intention. But statistically, odds are I'm going to lose every cent, despite what I just said. Statistically, that is what the probabilities would say. 
And if that's the case, if at the end of this, if I've worked as hard as I possibly could and gave it my all and I lose all your money, I need us to be able to have a drink together or, you know, look each other in the eye and and not have rancor over that. And I don't want to take your money if there's any risk of losing this relationship. And here's the reality. I didn't raise money from anybody who couldn't fully lose that money, um, that they were, you know, they'd had success in their own careers and and, and uh, were interested in fostering somebody else's success and hope for a return. And the one or two times where the person had expressed interest in investing in business, and I was pretty sure that was not the case, that they would be losing sleep over the investment, then I said, I basically sort of just quietly dropped the conversation because you're going to lose enough sleep over you know, what you need to do as an entrepreneur. You cannot take on the burden of somebody else's lost sleep. You want them to, you know, write a check and forget you, basically. That's that's the ideal circumstance. Yeah, and you say also you shouldn't have guilt over it not working out. Most don't. And also the VC shouldn't impose guilt or make you feel guilty in any way because that's the game that they play. But moving back to the book, once your funding sorted, your manufacturing actually becomes your next focus. And the dilemma, whether to go domestic or overseas and whether to trust China with counterfeiting, this one's fascinating because this is one that many people aren't familiar with. In the US and in in many countries, there's kind of a, a domestic pride about producing things domestically. It is an advantage for a company that can, in the US, claim you know, made in the USA. And, you know, if you're in France, made in France and made in Japan. And, you know, a lot of countries really do care about this. They they have sort of an inherent patriotism, but also a, a sort of deep-seated trust that things were probably done to a little bit higher standard or a, a more relevant standard in their own country. So this is the highest, best case if people can produce in their own country. And most of our makers set out to do that. They can't always continue on that path because sometimes the um, expertise no longer is available domestically or the costs, despite best efforts, are just way too high. So they end up offshoring production. In the U.S., China is the only country that I find to be a really big flashpoint. It's weird. If you produce in France or Japan, the countries I just mentioned, nobody sort of bats an eye. But China's a big flashpoint, and it's a flashpoint partly because of the rhetoric of our politicians, frankly, but it's a flashpoint because of the reality of the Chinese business culture is all about knockoffs and counterfeits. It's a very fiercely competitive market. So there isn't the same sort of legal protection nor moral protection in China against imitating and counterfeiting that there is here. And and we sort of you know, have legal protections, but also just sort of outrage over that when people steal other people's ideas. That's not exactly new. This has been the case in China for a long time. What's changed is that it used to be that Chinese counterfeit companies could not get credible distribution in the U.S. because this was a role a retailer played very healthily in the ecosystem. They would not buy a counterfeit product. I mean, counterfeits open them up to legal issues, but counterfeit products are cost reduced and cheaper and don't perform in in the vast majority of cases. So if somebody is stealing the brand name of a product and producing it cheaper, that's just a rat's nest of problems. Here's what's changed. Amazon is probably the best business ever born from a sheer effectiveness standpoint. And Jeff Bezos being the mastermind is all hats off to him. He's an incredible entrepreneur. And about three, four years ago, he started worrying about the competitive pressures from the Chinese marketplace, Alibaba. We think he thinks about Walmart all day, or he, you know, thinks about um, other companies. He thinks about Alibaba more than anyone. And so he changed a really important rule on Amazon, which was until four years ago, Anybody selling a product to a U.S. customer, say, or a, an Irish customer, had to have a domestic representative in that country. There was a middleman, basically. And he removed that rule because he wanted to invite Chinese sellers onto Amazon to sell in the various big markets they developed. 
and it really worked. The Chinese manufacturers flooded Amazon, and now 25% of what you buy on Amazon comes directly from a Chinese factory, a company that didn't do all the work to create distribution. They just take an express train to an Amazon customer. But the problem is, because they are not known for originating, their playbook is more about copying and counterfeiting. That's what they're doing. So when you buy a product on Amazon, and our makers discover this every single day to their great heartbreak, they will find their own photo on a package on a counterfeit product. They will find their own brand name that they've trademarked on a package. And it's always cheaper on Amazon than the real product. So it gets the top listing Amazon doesn't know the difference. You know, Amazon's not trying to sell you counterfeits, but they win the price war, the, these counterfeits. So you buy it, it fails, you're pissed, you blame the original company, they're out of business. Amazon did quite well in that transaction. You did not blame Amazon. You thought that you bought a crappy product from the originator. So that's the problem with selling on Amazon because customers who might want to buy your real product, you've done marketing, you've put a lot of money into building your brand, you've done all the right things, but they have Prime, so they'd rather buy it on Amazon. They click the buy button, and if you are present on Amazon, then your customers can't tell the difference between the counterfeits and yourselves. So the only way to really combat that as a maker is to make sure your brand is completely not on Amazon, because then you can tell customers anything you see there is fake. Another threat you call out with Amazon is their private label because they have so much data on what's selling and what's not. They remind me of big box retailers that have their own brand when it comes to something that sells really well and they understand the market really well. Likewise with Amazon and when they see something selling well, they see the volume sold, they can come out with their own product as well. Yes, and because they have the support of Wall Street to do things that are hard and expensive. Private label is not an easy thing to do. Amazon has the resources to take that data and do exactly what you said. So they now have 30 to 40%, I think it's 40% now of the US battery market. You know, why not buy Amazon Basics batteries? They're probably fine to put into whatever device you have. But here's the problem. Amazon is not investing in R&D for batteries. Batteries have huge environmental impact. Do we really want Amazon deciding as the sole entity what the battery R&D world is like and its impact on the environment? We kind of don't care maybe if Duracell goes out of business because like, I never had a huge attachment to Duracell to begin with. These batteries are 30% cheaper. But the innovation behind those batteries and what it takes, that brand has a price for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're not usually going home and buying, you know, the CEO is usually not going home and buying a jet with those margins. The CEO is usually investing, you hope, in R&D and especially in a product like a battery, something that will benefit society essentially down the road. It's a humble battery, but it's a lot more than that. From reading the case studies and what you said here about Amazon, it really shows that the retailers taking 50% margin isn't that bad a deal because if you avoid all this plethora of marketing investment you need to do getting out there and walking the streets and also all the threats that you avoid as a result. Yeah, credible re retailers, which I would say, you know, most are, I, I, I'm not, I'm not really sorting them other than a couple of the big digital platforms like Amazon are in business to have long-term relationships with their suppliers. It's, it's inefficient for them not to, so they want you to do well. They'll squeeze you, of course. They're not, you know, they're not the benevolent organizations, but they are trying to protect their customer. They know that their customer will blame them if they sell them a shoddy product, certainly a counterfeit, but just a weak product. They will take responsibility for those products. So they play a very good role in sort of curating for quality and for the customer's value and end benefit. They're putting a lot of infrastructure, whether it be keeping the lights on and having the real estate, but especially the trained staff to actually talk about your product because the more innovative your product is, the more likely it is to um, sort of die on the shelves unless there's somebody there to help it because you're not looking for it. It's not that your product isn't great or the packaging isn't good, but it's very helpful to have a sales staff who can go the little bit extra to get people to pay attention to something that they haven't ever imagined existed. So they do an awful lot of marketing too, to bring people into that store, the marketing dollars that you don't have to spend. So 
It's kind of this fad or trend right now, uh, direct to consumer. I do a lot of work at Harvard Business School and listen to a lot of pitches. And it's almost like somebody's like taken over the air vents and piped like this subliminal message of direct to consumer. It's so much better. <laughs> you know, knock out the middleman. You'll have better margins. And you hear these messages in the market, like, you know, whether it's Casper, Casper mattresses or anything you buy directly, like we cut out the middleman so you get a better product at a lower price. That's not true because the new rent, if you're not paying the 50% to retail or you're paying it to Facebook and Google to find customers is digital rent. So I would much rather pay that rent to my local retailer. I'd even rather pay it to Walmart than I would to Facebook or Google because they're creating jobs, especially in the case of local retailers, a streetscape that I enjoy seeing as opposed to empty storefronts. They're creating jobs for teenagers who learn how to do customer service in their, you know, surliest stage of themselves. It's a good time for them to learn that. Local retail has a lot of benefits. You don't see Amazon's name on the back of a Little League or soccer t-shirt. You see the local bar or the local restaurant or the local gift shop. So they have a lot of reasons why we should want them to exist. And the least of all is their own pocketbook. We can get a safer, trusted product when we buy it from a regular retailer. You call this out in the book as well. Amidst all your marketing, amidst all the fact that the product is the marketing, etc., at the heart of it, be a human brand. And as the world goes more global, you act more local. That's been a big tenet of the grommet, like making business human again, because Remember, I, even though I'm a social media kind of maven, or at least a, maybe not maven, but I was a pioneer, I was concerned about digitizing everything, all relationships and the general trend in that area. So it was a big commitment in our business to always feature the maker and ourselves. And video is a great platform for that to say, no, here's me on this video. I tested this product or here's me. I made this product and lend our own reputation to our customers, essentially, that they could trust us. It's so basic, but it's kind of revolutionary today to have the courage to do that. Jules, you cover so much in the book. We're not going to get through it all. You cover e-commerce, payments, finance, inventory management. There's so much in this book, and you go really, really deep on it and align each of those chapters with many, many case studies. So we're not going to get it through today, but there's a quote I really loved where you talk of ideas when scaling your business. It summed up for me the spirit of innovation that you have, and it goes like this. And sometimes, the best times, the real magic happens when you just try something that you haven't seen anywhere, and that novelty or special arbitrage opportunity puts unexpected wind in your sails, and you ride that condition as long as you can or until others discover it. I love that, and I thought it was a great way to finish today's show, and I welcome you now to leave our audience with a call to action like you do in the book to see this opportunity, to consider it, and give a bit of encouragement for what lies ahead. I've always managed my life to have no regrets. And I've never found that I regretted things I did do. It's more the things that I didn't do. And I try to keep those to a tiny, tiny list. And entrepreneurship kind of falls in that bucket. I'll give an example from my own life. When I was starting the business, it was hard to understand. And my brother, who loves me, said, what are you going to do if it fails? And I knew what he really meant was when it fails. And I didn't almost blink an eye. I kind of said, look, I'm not going to be unemployable. I'll make sure my family doesn't end up in the gutter and I'll get a job. But I need to do this. I need to see this through. I think everybody has kind of a physical tell of when they're nervous about something. And usually that means to me. I'm on a growth edge. Like it's actually, even though it doesn't feel good, it's the right place to be. So for me, it's my stomach. My stomach just kind of does flip flops or gets churny. And other people's, it could, people could be headaches. It could be uh, sleeplessness, lots of reasons why they physical reactions, but try to embrace that because I think the people who end up most disappointed in life are the people who once they hit that thing, like, oh, I'm nervous. Ooh, I don't like this headache. I don't like this heartbeat that I'm feeling. They back off of it. And if they just push through that thing of, okay, this is not going to feel good, but I'm going to walk through this fear. Everybody's fear. I have my own fear. I'm going to walk through this fear. 
And the way I walk through it isn't like just arbitrarily walking through. I let my brain start to work on what are all the worst things that could happen. So like my body is just instinctually reacting badly, right? It's unhappy. It doesn't like what I'm about to do. But then I let my brain kind of take over and say, what's the worst thing that could happen? In the case of my brother, it was I'll get a job. Often the worst thing that can happen is something you can live with. So you say, okay, that might happen. I can do this. And you walk through that physical sensation, you walk through the mental, you know, kind of gymnastics of, of outcomes. And then you're on the other side, actually doing the thing. Every time you do that, you build up a muscle. I call it the confidence muscle. It's confidence in yourself. And these businesses require that. They require not a blind pursuit of the opportunity, but an acknowledgement of the risks and the the hard physical reactions, emotional reactions, and then the more intellectual and objective assessment of the risks, and then do it. Do it. Because to be the person, you know, at age 90 who, who says, I wish I had, that's far worse. Nobody judges you for a failure the way you do. People are too busy. They hear about your failure. You know, it's one conversation. Okay, what are you doing next? That's pretty cool you did that. How can I help you? That's where it goes. <laughs> like <laughs> everybody just moves on and, and you can too. Beautiful way to finish it. And Jules, where can people find out more about you, the grommet, the book, et cetera? I'm easy to find on social um, because I just use my real name. It's J-U-L-E-S and P like Peter, I-E-R-I. So Instagram's where I'm most active, but Twitter as well. And then the book itself, there's a whole website for it, how we make stuff now. It's obviously available in all the places you buy books, including dreaded Amazon. Um, <laughs> has, I, don't need, I, I swear to you, I don't know all the people who reviewed it. And it's a five-star book. It's been a bestseller there. It's on Barnes & Noble. But you can also find out more about it on my own website because I actually do keep that website up and add new resources to it as I learn new things since the book has been published. Jules Pieri, author of How We Make Stuff Now, Turn Ideas into Products That Build Successful Businesses. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Aiden. It was a blast.